I'm in Europe now. I've spent a couple of weeks in Denmark, and in the last couple of days, I've been driving south. And when I'm looking out of the the windshield of my my rental car here, I can see the Alps. Wow, wow, wow! It is so beautiful. Uh, Snow-capped top mountains ahead, and uh, I'm going to visit the sixth smallest country in the world, the fourth smallest country in Europe, and it's called Liechtenstein. My name is Palabo, and this is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. The ultimate destination for armchair travelers who are looking for inspiration to get out into the real world and let loose their wanderlust. This is the Radio Vagabond. Welcome to the Radio Vagabond, where we explore the world's most fascinating destinations. Today we're heading to one of the smallest countries in Europe, nestled between Switzerland and Austria. It may be tiny, but don't let its size fool you. It's packed with interesting facts that will leave you in awe. From being the world's leading producer of false teeth, to having the highest per capita GDP and the richest monarchy in Europe, This country is full of surprises. So buckle up and let's get ready to discover the wonders of Liechtenstein. The Radio Vagabond. Gotta keep moving. Liechtenstein is completely landlocked between Austria and Switzerland. And I I did some research uh, this morning and and, uh, learned that uh, most of the country, which... uh, It's not that many people, I think 30, 35,000. They live uh, close to the border to Switzerland because uh, close to the border to Austria, uh, there's basically only mountains. So when I was in Germany this morning and punched in uh, into my Google Maps navigation system and said, take me to Liechtenstein, I thought for sure uh, it was going to take me over the border to Switzerland and then into Liechtenstein. So, much to my surprise, uh, um, all of a sudden I I passed a sign saying, you are now in Austria. So, I'm in Austria now, um, and, um, well, I'm such a a modern human being that I'm just following uh, the machine. And, um, yeah, I'm I'm going to Liechtenstein, and uh, I'm sure that Mr. Google will show me the way. But that also means that... This day, I'm going to be in four countries. First, Germany, now Austria, in half an hour, Liechtenstein, and then I'm uh, spending the night in Switzerland. So, four countries within six, seven hours. I intend to spend most of uh, the afternoon or all of the afternoon in in Liechtenstein. I'm going to be there just after noon. It's it's half past uh, 11 now. And uh, and then yeah, I'm gonna spend the the entire uh, afternoon there. So I I will get to see a lot of the country. It is so tiny. I can drive from north to south in about half an hour, depending on the roads, and uh, 10 15 minutes from east to west, and that's the entire country. So um, I will be able to see and explore the country, and hopefully speak to some of the locals as well Uh, but since my German is not that good and especially the German that they speak here is 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 a dialect close to the Swiss German and I know for a fact that that is uh, so different than the German I I learned in school back in the Middle Ages so depending on if if I find somebody who can speak English but um, I hope so and um, I will take you along on my journey This episode is brought to you in part by Hotels25.com. Whenever you need a hotel anywhere in the world, go to Hotels25.com. That would get you the best price. Hotels25.com searches a bunch of the biggest hotel sites in one simple search. (laughs) Hotels25.com. I thought for sure I was going to be... Since Liechtenstein is in between Switzerland and Austria, I thought for sure that I was going to go from Austria to Liechtenstein. But now I'm in Switzerland. So I crossed the border into Austria and then not into 
into Liechtenstein, but into Switzerland. So I, it's it's not like me to not really know where I am. I think I better stop now and and take a look at the map because this is uh, this is getting a little bit ridiculous. I really trust you, Google. Um, okay, I'll get back to you. It's so small; it's easy to miss. So while I try to find my way to Liechtenstein, let's have a look at some hardcore facts about this micronation. And now, facts about where we are. are. Liechtenstein is the sixth smallest country in the world. It's so small that you could probably sneeze and miss it. With an area of just 160 square kilometers, 62 square miles, it's often referred to as a microstate. It's 24.5 24.5 kilometers, 15.2 miles long, and 9.4 kilometers, 5.8 miles wide. And the total population is only 38,387. Liechtenstein is one of the only two doubled landlocked countries in the world. That means that not only is Liechtenstein landlocked, but so are the countries that borders it. The only other one is Uzbekistan. It's not a part of the EU, but they are a part of the Schengen area, which means that they have open borders and visa policies with the EU. And it's very easy to enter the country by bus or car from Switzerland or Austria, without even showing your passport. If you're one of those people collecting passport stamps, you can go to the local tourist office, give them three Swiss francs, and they'll stamp your passport. And speaking of getting to the country, you'll have to do it by land, since they don't have an airport. And when you drive to the country, try not to get lost on the way like I did. There are other things they don't have, apart from an airport, like their own currency. Liechtenstein is the only country, other than Switzerland, to use the Swiss franc as its official currency. Also, they have no military. Being a small, landlocked nation, the neighboring countries provide a strong defense umbrella and have traditionally ensured the security of Liechtenstein. There's also a mutual defense treaty with Switzerland, which covers their defense needs. And finally, they don't have their own language. Well, they sort of don't. They speak German, but with a unique dialect called Walser German. It's like German, but with a Liechtensteinian twist. And when I said before it sounds more like Swiss German, I was probably wrong. I've since found out that Liechtenstein German and Swiss German are different dialects. It shares some similarities with Swiss German, but it also has its own distinct features. So I take it back. Ich möchte es zurücknehmen. They do have their own language. Liechtenstein German. Well, sort of. And that was Facts About Where We Are. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. I'll be back with some surprising facts later in this episode. But now, let's see if I'm finally arriving to the country. So, back to me. Okay, now I'm actually in Liechtenstein. And this is a tiny, tiny country, as I mentioned before. I came into the country, I didn't even realize I crossed the border, but now I'm here. I am in the biggest city in the country called Shan, S-H-A-A-N. It's not the capital, but it's the biggest city. A little bit south of here, around five miles, there's the capital, and I'm going there next. But first, uh, I'm, I'm going for a walk here in Shan. As I arrive in this charming town, Shan, The first thing that captures my attention is the interesting blend of architectural styles. Shan streets are a delightful mishmash of designs where modern glass structures stand alongside traditional timber houses. The vibrant colors of the buildings add a touch of whimsy to the scene and it's both surprising and delightful. As I explore, I discover Shan's warm and welcoming atmosphere. The locals, known for their friendliness, greet me with a genuine smile and make me feel right at home. The town's small size is a part of its intimate charm, allowing me to easily navigate its streets and engage with the community. After a walk and a cup of coffee, I get back in the car and drive the long, 
eight-minute drive south, with the stunning mountains on my left-hand side, to the capital, Vaduz. Here I go into the tourist office to speak to Louise Hansen. Imagine going into the tourist office here in uh, in Liechtenstein and uh, finding a fellow Scandinavian. <laughs> hi, hi, Louise. <laughs> you're you're from Sweden, and uh, how did you end up working here? Um, I was born here in Liechtenstein, and I grew up here in Liechtenstein. Uh, my father and so you're not technically Swedish. I am. Okay. I'm 100% Swedish because okay. um, my whole family lives in Sweden uh-huh. uh, from Gothenburg. But my father and mother came here to Liechtenstein in the 70s because my father was a dentist. And at that time, um, they had like only like four dentists in the whole country. And they needed more dentists in Liechtenstein. And uh, yeah, that's why he could stay here and work here. And um, and then he said, we're going to stay two years or three years and then move on. But uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Got 30 years or more. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, how, how how much of your life have you lived in Sweden? Uh, all together about mm, like six years or something. Oh, okay. Six yeah. seven years. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So your your German is better than your Swedish. No, I think. Um, you could walk down the streets of Stockholm and people wouldn't notice. Um, <laughs> they, some people notice. No, I think because uh, Swedish is my first language, but um, sometimes they say I have like a German accent uh, in the back, so I sound like uh, Sylvia, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, from Sweden. Um, yeah. That's well, actually, uh, coming from uh, dentist parents, uh, you would be the perfect to ask this question. It's one of my questions. I heard a rumor that a lot of the f- What's it called? False teeth uh, yeah. are made here in They're Liechtenstein. Here, yeah, twenty-five percent of all in the world is yeah. what I heard. That's right. That's uh, Ivo Klar. It's uh-huh. called the company is called Ivo Klar Viva Dent, uh-huh. and my father worked for them also. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're based in in Shan. so like that's the second biggest um, business in uh, mm. Liechtenstein. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so so random. So random. Yeah. 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 yeah so random. In a minute, I'll have some more random and surprising facts about this tiny country. And probably the most surprising one is that Russia offered Liechtenstein to buy a huge landmass from them before they sold it to the United States. More about that and a bunch of other things that I'm sure will surprise you when the program continues. Stay with us. You can see pictures, videos and links and read much more on the RadioVagabond.com. You can also send a few lines to Palabo and get featured on the show. Tell him where you are and what you're doing right now as you're listening to these words. Just click on contact on the radiovagabond.com and fill out the form. The name's Bond. Radio Vagabond. So right now I'm lucky to meet somebody who's an expert on the royal families of not only Liechtenstein but all over Europe. And Paul Rosner is your name. And uh, how come you, as an American, became so interested in the 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 royal families of Europe? I don't really know. I was a very young child, like 10 or 11, and I remember being in the school library and seeing a book on Queen Elizabeth. And I opened the book, and all of a sudden this family tree came out like five pages wide and i was fascinated by that um and ever since then yeah so in when when all your friends were playing football or baseball (laughs) you would be studying the royal families (laughs) i remember getting up at 6 30 in the morning a couple a few years later to get up and watch the wedding of charles and diana And when we met, you impressed me not only in the knowing, obviously, the queen's name of Denmark, but also her kids and who they were married to, and uh, Crown Prince Frederick and his wife Mary that he met in Tasmania, Australia. They've got a, a lot of kids. Four. <laughs> Christian, Isabella, Vincent, and Josephine. You are kidding. I couldn't even tell that. So I'm impressed. And what about the old king? First married to Alexandra. Yeah. Uh-huh. Alex, as we call her. Yeah, that. From where? Uh, Hong Kong, I right, think, right. and uh, ethnic English and Chinese. Yeah. And they had Nikolai and Felix, uh-huh. 
then they got divorced and he married Marie from France. Yeah. And they have Henri. Yeah. And They're named after who? Prince Gamal and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Prince Henrik. Yeah, they from uh, the, the, the 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 husband of Queen of, of Queen Margareta who actually he was it was his life goal to be called king. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. but never yeah. happened. Henri. And yeah. And then the youngest, uh, Athena. Athena. Okay. I am so impressed. But we're not here to talk about the, <laughs> <laughs> the royal families of Denmark. Just to set it up. When we come back, Paul is going to share some interesting knowledge about the royal family of Liechtenstein. You don't want to miss this. We'll have more from the Radio Vagabond's official senior royal correspondent, Paul Rosna, in a bit. Before that, I promised you some surprising facts about Liechtenstein, so strap in and pay attention. And now, surprising facts about where we are. Liechtenstein is the only country in the world to have won an Olympic medal and not have a National Olympic Committee. Liechtenstein is home to the world's largest collection of postage stamps. So if you're a stamp collector, Liechtenstein is basically your mecca. They were the last European country to allow women to vote. It was as late as 1984, after the United Nations and various global organizations had championed equal rights for women. That finally echoes through the corridors of power in Liechtenstein. They embraced the crazy idea of women casting their ballots. They have the lowest crime rate of just about any country in the world, and their prisons are most often empty. And if someone is sentenced more than two years, they're sent to Austria, just so they don't feel too lonely, I guess. The country has a very developed and highly industrialized free enterprise economy, and being a tax haven, many companies are registered here in Liechtenstein. In fact, they have more registered companies than citizens. And here comes the interesting one. Alaska was once a Russian territory, and according to the current monarch, Prince Hans Adam, something he said in an interview with the largest daily newspaper in the country, he was told that Russia offered Alaska to Liechtenstein before the Tsar sold it to America in 1867. Here's the story. According to the prince, one of his predecessors spoke fluent Russian and had strong ties with the Tsar of Russia. At one point, most likely in a cozy conversation over cigars and vodka, the Russian Tsar offered the personal sale of Alaska to the prince. It sounds like folklore and just like another good story. And to be honest, there are no documents to support this. But it does come from the prince himself. And can you imagine what it would be like if Liechtenstein had agreed and bought Alaska? Alaska is 10,698 times the size of Liechtenstein. So the world map would certainly look a bit different if they had. And they could afford it. The monarchy of Liechtenstein is the richest in Europe. According to Statistica.com, the royal family here has a net worth of $6.8 billion. This is thanks to the ownership of a private bank, extensive investments and land holdings. In comparison, the British royal family has a net worth of $460 million, so a lot less. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. The reason I went to the tourist office in Vaduz was to find somebody who could tell me why tourists come here to Liechtenstein. What's so unique about this country? Here's Louise again. It's very beautiful. Uh, right. It's very special because it's such a small country. It's the fourth smallest in uh, Europe. And um, many people come here. They should come here because um, we have beautiful mountains and you can go skiing here in the winter we also have like a skiing resort a small one but it's very good for families and nice and also hiking we're famous for hiking Mm -hmm. we have um, a lot of famous like and big hiking trails and um, it's famous also because we're a principality we have a castle in Faduz in the capital and we have a princely family that's very nice and do, do they live close to here where we are now in now in the capital they live in the castle inside mm-hmm. yeah the castle another rumor i heard is that 
They make a lot of money. Uh, it, even more than Queen Elizabeth. Is that just a rumor or is that true? That's true, yeah. Yeah. Now that we're on the topic of the princely family, let's get back with Paul Rosner, the Radio Vagabond's official senior royal correspondent, and hear what he has to say about this. The wealth started a few centuries ago. Uh, they were great landowners in Bohemia, which eventually became the Czech Republic. Um, and when I say great landowners, I mean they owned land like the size of Luxembourg. Way bigger than Liechtenstein. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And they were princes, eventually became princes in the Holy Roman Empire. Right. So that means the emperor granted them the title of prince. I've noticed that they don't call themselves kings, uh, even though they're on top. Like, they would in most other royal families. It's Prince Adam, who's technically the the head of uh, the monarchy in Liechtenstein, but yes. he's kind of retired. Hans Adam, yes. Yeah, right. Um, What did I say? Adam. <laughs> It's Hans Adam. Hans Adam, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, he sort of retired. Um, he's older now, and his wife died, and he's got other things to do. So the son, Prince Alois, is the head of the government for all intents and purposes. He's the regent. But has he officially abdicated or is it just... No, he's, Hans Adam is still officially the prince mm -hmm. of Liechtenstein. Yeah. And, they, and Alois is technically the, the crown regions. prince? Yeah, yeah yes, right. yes, technically. Um, but he's actually the, the ruler for all intents and purposes mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. The reason that they're not a royal family in their princely family, I think is probably because, A, Liechtenstein is very small, and it would be very funny to call it a kingdom. Okay? Yeah, but still. <laughs> still, there's the kingdom of Iswanti that's Maybe, also yeah, tiny. That. Um, <laughs> and then they were given the title of prince yeah. by the Holy Roman Emperors, right. and I think they value that okay. very old, very prestigious title. Right. Yeah. So... The family is actually pretty interesting. You'd think they were all, you know, this Germanic right. thing or, or whatever. But um, the current prince's uh, second son, Max, uh, about 20 years ago, married a uh, woman of Panamanian African-American heritage, right. An Angela Brown. And they were married in New York City with the blessing of his parents. And she wore one of the family's tiaras, diamond tiaras, to the wedding. Her mother-in-law lent it to her. And they have a son, uh, Prince Constantine, who is a uh, mixed race. Yeah. Yep. And she's had no problem assimilating into this family and into this social strata. Is that, is that a first in the Europe uh, royal families? Uh, well, there is uh, Harry and Meghan. Uh, but, yeah, uh, Angela was uh, 16 years before Harry and Meghan. Yeah. And... Um, She was the first person of African descent to marry into a reigning royal family, right. a family that still has power. Right. There's been another marriage in the Habsburg family, but the Habsburgs are exiled and don't count for anything in, that, in Austria. So, yeah, so this is actually uh, was a very, very interesting first kind of marriage for, for this yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Where does all the wealth come from? The wealth ended up being uh, from great investments a hundred years ago or so into banking. Yeah. And currently, I believe I'm correct, they are the last privately owned family bank. Yeah. They, it's not publicly shared or anything like this. There's no partners. It's the family of the prince and the prince himself that own the bank. And the bank is a multi-billion dollar corporation. Yeah. They are currently, I believe, the richest sovereign family in Europe. Yeah, that's what I heard, and, and I always assumed that that would be the British monarchy. Mm. But no, what even, I the Dutch are even higher than the British monarchy. That's right. Yeah, from because they own a lot of Shell oil, or they used to own Shell oil. Right. It used to be called Dutch Royal Shell. Oh, interesting. Mm. He's got so much money, but then he's kind of a different kind of monarch because he would walk the streets. Is that is that true? Yeah, that's true. 
They ah. work they walk around here like normal and uh, the kids go to school here and they go to the supermarket and the post office and They go to the supermarket? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 and to the pharmacy and yeah. I met the prince like a few months ago in the pharmacy and it's like totally normal and yeah, yeah. they have And then you just say hoy. Yeah. Is, yeah, is, that's the way you say hi here. Yeah, that's you yeah. say hoy in Liechtenstein. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so is, I, I guess they're beloved, uh, uh, and, and the people of Liechtenstein, yeah. they, they love the, the they're family. Very beloved, yeah, and and um, they're very nice, and um, people here in Liechtenstein are very proud that we have like the princely family, and yeah. So, despite Prince Hans Adam being a multi-billionaire, he's often seen strolling the streets of Vaduz, the capital of Liechtenstein, engaging in casual conversations with the locals and visiting shops, pharmacies and establishments. He does that without extensive security measures. Another thing that shows the close relationship between the princely family and its citizens is when the Prince of Liechtenstein invites all Liechtenstein residents to his castle in Vaduz, the official residence of the princely family. This happens on Liechtenstein's National Day, held on August the 15th each year. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they they have a national day every year in the summertime, and usually the the whole family goes out and meets and greets pretty much everybody that's a citizen <laughs> of Liechtenstein. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think there's free days in, in the castle grounds, and yeah. everybody can come and visit. And yeah, it's, it's not like you can go and use the bathroom no. uh, or something no, like no, that. No, no, but, but I do think he serves wine to everybody. It's and like a big garden snack. party. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the invitation reflects the prince's desire to connect with the people and express gratitude for their support and loyalty. This is, This is the Radio the Vagabond. Radio Vagabond podcast. In my country, Denmark, the royal family gets their money from the Danish taxpayers. This has made some, not a lot, but a few people say that we're better off without the royals, that we should be a republic. I had to ask Louise if that's the case here too. I like, still know people saying, oh, yeah. what do they do for their money? Or is it, is it really worth it for the country to pay them so much money? No people saying, oh, we want a republic. Um. No, um, because I shouldn't say that, but um, it's it's like he has a lot of money. Um, I think he's like the fourth richest man in Europe and uh, Hans Adam, the prince of Liechtenstein. And he has his own money, so it's not like we we pay money for the prince. Uh, No, the system is a lot different here. He has his own money. And unlike Denmark and any other European monarchy maybe with the exception of Monaco, the royals are basically just for show, and mostly their roles are symbolic and ceremonial. They also play a role in preserving and promoting their country's cultural heritage and engage in diplomatic activities like representing their countries on official visits abroad and hosting foreign state leaders at home. But in Liechtenstein, the prince is the head of state and holds a unique power known as the right to veto. This power allows him to effectively block legislation approved by the parliament. At some point, someone in parliament tried to change that. Here's Paul again. The citizenry in the the nominal government know what side their bread is buttered on. (laughs) And that is the princely family. And uh, maybe a decade or so ago, the prince wanted uh, to uh, veto something, I believe. Yeah because they wanted to curtail his powers. They wanted to lower the powers that he has. And he basically was like, well, if you do that, I'm taking my toys and throwing them out of the pram. Or basically, I'm done with this. I'll leave. I'll go move to Switzerland, take all my money. (laughs) I'm a big fan of uh, Paul Barbardo and Geography Now, the the YouTube channel. And uh, when he did the episode about Liechtenstein, he basically said it like this. We want to take away your powers of exercising the option to veto bills. Hmm, I mean, if you really don't want me around, I can totally just leave and let you guys handle everything. Really? Yeah, I'll just take my $7.6 billion corporate interest and revenue deals outside of the state. But, you know, you can sell postcards to tourists. Wait, come back! And over three quarters of the population voted to let him remain with his original duties. Right, right. Which is, uh... 
you know, they, they actually have the money. That expression, put your money where your mouth is, they actually have that money. Yeah. So to back up whatever they say. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the government sort of backed down, and the prince still has his powers. But the current prince is still alive, but he sort of retired a few years back. Mm-hmm. And his son, Alois, is the actual head of the, the royal government now yeah. uh, for, I think, about a decade. And then the, the princess died uh, a couple of years ago. She was about 80 mm-hmm. something. So currently, the son and daughter in law are the, the heads of the family. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the wife is a Duchess of Bavaria, Sophie. Okay. Yeah, because we're pretty close to uh, southern Germany. Uh, and, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, and they were married about 20, 25 years ago, I think. Um, and it was a big society wedding at the time. Yeah. And she, interestingly enough, if anybody here follows uh, the Jacobite claim to the throne of England and Scotland, uh, she is the eventual heiress of that line when her uncle and her father die. So then that Jacobite claim will come into the princely family of Liechtenstein. Uh, yeah. We, we should have had a jingle saying geek alert here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always add, add one in, right? Yeah. <laughs> If travel is your passion and you want escapism while still upholding your work and family responsibilities, you can travel vicariously from the comfort of your own home. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. Vaduz is a pint-sized wonderland of Liechtenstein. As I stepped into the charming capital, I felt like Alice tumbling down the rabbit hole in a real-life dollhouse. The city's impeccable organization and cleanliness made it feel like a miniature world on steroids. It was as if a tiny custodian would pop up at any moment to sweep the streets with a toothbrush. The first thing that struck me was its size. Vaduz is so small that you can walk from one end to the other in minutes. And the scent of wealth hung in the air, courtesy of Liechtenstein's tax haven status. The mere thought of million dollar deals being made over champagne and caviar seemed to float in the breeze. And of course, Vaduz Castle on its hill, a fairy tale dream with towers straight out of Disney. This one only with a real prince. And as I walked around, I discovered a delightful art scene with galleries and museums popping up in every nook and cranny. And in the middle of all this grandeur, but it still retained its small town charm. It may be small, but it's huge on charm. I have a couple of myths I'd like to, to bust. The, the country is so small, so everybody knows everybody. Uh, yeah, yeah, they say that, um, but uh, I don't know everybody in Liechtenstein. <laughs> <laughs> Only 75%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we're like 38,000 people in the whole country, so I don't know all of them. Uh, but you know a lot of people, and uh, yeah, you say hi to a lot of people. And because yeah. uh, um, it's a small country, you see a lot of people a lot. Uh, yeah. And there's a good chance you know them or you know somebody who knows them. Yeah, so you just yeah. say hoy all the yeah, time. Hoy, yeah, hoy. How are you? And then yeah. you go on. Yeah. 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 Another one is that uh, it's so expensive here. Everything is so ex- expensive. Is that true? Mm, depends on what you want to do. <laughs> but uh, of course, well, we have. Maybe not compared to Norway or Switzerland, but, but still. Not similar to Switzerland, it is. Okay. Yeah, it is. We so have expensive. The Swiss, we, have the, we have the Swiss franc also, like Switzerland. That's our currency in Liechtenstein. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it's expensive to, um, to live here in an apartment or um, to go grocery shopping. Yeah, but then you have like our skiing resort in Malbun, and that's for family and it's very nice. And that's... Uh, much cheaper than go skiing in uh, Switzerland and uh, mm. it's not so expensive mm. and yeah everything is relevant you know it's like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is absolutely beautiful and like you said so many mountains even though the country is so small half of it is covered by mountains yeah, is that that's right? right yeah, yeah. that's right yeah. so a, a, a good week here um, what should, what's the top three things that you should do If we say, okay, it's summertime, you can't go skiing. So 
what should what should you do when you get here? You can do a lot in Liechtenstein. Many people think, yeah, because it's a such a small country, there's not much to do. But it's actually you have a lot to do for a whole week. And we also have like an adventure pass with 30 attractions uh, you can buy, and um, you save a lot of money then also in Liechtenstein if you buy the adventure pass. And it includes like um, the up in the mountains you can go with a cable car up and down and um, enjoy a meal up there at the top of the mountain. And down here in Fadutz, um, many things to do in the capital. You can go to all the museums. We have a history museum, an art museum, treasure chamber museum, and the post museum. It's uh, also something to do. We're famous for our stamps, so you can just go in to the post museum. Can, can, can I go and uh, get my passport stamped? Yes, you can also do that. That costs you three Swiss francs. Yeah, yeah, I heard about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah but that's uh, also included in, in the pass, if you would look to that and uh, you also can go to the winery from the prince we have a winery in Fadutz that's mm-hmm. very beautiful and mm-hmm. nice and you can go tasting the wine from the prince and we have like a small train in the summer it takes you around uh, 35 minutes called a city train mm-hmm. uh, explains all the history and what you see that's very nice and um, you can also go outside of Fadutz um, you can go like to a bird park outside of Fadutz called in Mauren that's beautiful and uh, also, you could go to Balsas. There's another castle there also called Gutenberg, where you can go a little bit more inside. It's very nice to see. And yeah, you can go swimming and you can in the summer and you can go, yeah, mini golf. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot of stuff to do. Yeah. But for people listening to this, uh, when you get to Liechtenstein, the first thing you do is go into the tourist office and ask for Louise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tell her that I sent you. Thank you so much. It's so nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you. Also, a big thanks to the Radio Vagabond's official senior royal correspondent, Paul Rosner. Thank you so much, Paul. I'm going to bring you back every time I need to talk about the royal families because it's always nice to geek out. And I love talking about it, as you can tell. You're probably like, shut up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at your service, Polly, anytime you need me. <laughs> and now... Here's a poem written and read by an AI. Palais Beau, the radio vagabond, set his sights on Liechtenstein, a land of surprising delights. It's so small, you might miss it in a glance, and our adventurer almost lost his chance. Their prince has riches that astound, but still, he shops in the supermarket he's found. He also invites the people to his castle each year, serving wine, spreading joy, with a smile and a cheer. Liechtenstein, where oddities take root, false teeth they produce, oh what a hoot. No airports, no military, just peace they bestow. They almost bought Alaska, but politely said no. Mountains and towns, a picturesque view, Palais Beau's visit is a trip worth pursuing. For in this land of mountains and quaint appeal, Liechtenstein's charm, forever surreal. We will now be arriving at the end of this installment of the Radio Vagabond. Mind the gap between this episode and the next one. And dear listeners, before we part ways, a favor to ask, if I may, please leave a review in your podcast app, with kind words and five stars, give it a clap. Your reviews bring joy to Palais' heart, like a warm embrace, they play their part. With your support, his spirits soar high, so leave a review. And now, bye-bye. My name's Palabo, and I gotta keep moving. See ya. Produced by radioguru.co.uk.